How does atomic energy help tell time? What's the big change in the design of pencils? Which new product is demonstrated by goldfish? Who builds an underground cafeteria for cattle? Industry on Parade, Peabody Award winner for public service, produced on film each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. The Grandfather Clock, a well-made timepiece that won't gain or lose more than a few seconds a week. And that's pretty accurate, you'll agree. But as they're demonstrating at industrial places like this one in Malden, Massachusetts, it's not nearly accurate enough in the age of electronics, when certain instruments, like television tubes, must be regulated to operate at precise frequencies measured in millionths of a second. What we see being assembled here at National Company Incorporated is an atomic clock which can assure the utmost accuracy even when measuring segments of time as infinitesimal as a millionth or a billionth of a second. An ampule containing a tiny particle of the silvery metal called cesium has been inserted in a little electric oven. The cesium containing oven is installed in the bottom of a tube, which now will be lowered into a vacuum chamber. The lowering is done by, of all things, an auto jack. They take it mighty easy, for this clock will sell for somewhere between ten and thirty thousand dollars. With the cesium at the bottom of the vacuum chamber, they now prepare to create the vacuum. This device will exhaust the air. When the electric oven is heated, the cesium inside shoots a stream of atomic particles against a detecting screen, which measures their frequency. And since this frequency is exact and unchanging, it serves as a basic standard of time, the most precise and accurate standard we have. Dr. Richard Daly of the firm scientific staff explains to colleagues, far more explicitly than we've been able to do, just how the atomic clock works and how it can be used to increase tremendously the effectiveness of communications, navigation, research, any project in which really accurate timekeeping is essential. This is one of the earlier, less compact, but highly sensitive models of the clock. When the vacuum system is turned on and the clock starts working, it takes liquid nitrogen to keep it cool. It was at Massachusetts Institute of Technology's Research Laboratory of Electronics that the atomic clock was developed by Professor Gerald Zacharias, whom we find going over old ground. Did we say old ground? This periodic table listing the elements is man's newest frontier. Dr. Zacharias uses a sort of pinball machine to demonstrate why. The ball represents an atom. Uncontrolled, it goes its own way, follows the line of least resistance. But controlled and put to work, as in the doctor's clock, the atom can be made to do what we want it to do. Drive submarines, generate electricity, cure disease. Yes, even tell time. Expecting our country to move ahead without the chance for a fair profit is like expecting an automobile to run without gas or oil. The expectation of profits led investors and businessmen to seek newer and better fabrics, refrigerators, washing machines, and thousands of other articles. Billions of dollars plowed back into industry helped it expand at an astonishing rate. Profits make products. Profits create jobs. Profits mean progress. Let's ensure tomorrow's jobs and living standards by encouraging the quest for profits instead of discouraging it through high and discriminatory taxes. Industry on Parade goes south to Atlanta to learn about the newest development in writing instruments. The ballpoint pen has long since established itself. Now comes the ballpoint pencil 
manufacture of the pencil that never needs sharpening begins here at Scripto Incorporated with the molding of the plastic barrels. The barrels emerge from the mold, linked together in groups of eight. The fluid graphite pencils, incidentally, retain the hexagonal shape traditional with conventional pencils. Four at a time, the barrels are stamped with the trademark. After this, the barrels can be snipped apart. This plant is one of the few that depends on no outside suppliers for any of the parts of its products. Even the tiny balls for the ball points are ground and polished here on the premises. They are minute spheres of stainless steel. Every one must be individually inspected under a microscope before it is accepted for use in a pen or pencil. Rejects are sucked off by vacuum. All other metal parts are fabricated in this department. These are the replaceable cartridge tubes. This is the clip that holds the pencil in one's pocket. The clutches that hold the ball point in writing position until released and then retracted into the barrel are made on this strange looking device. But even more interesting is the machine that automatically performs all operations on the tip of the pencil. It drills a hole, introduces a ball, closes the sides to retain the ball, then drills the tiniest of holes to admit air and exude the liquid lead. The capsules that hold the lead inside the cartridge tubes are made of vinyl plastic. This gal, cutting them to length, would do very well in a spaghetti factory. Now assembly begins. Actually, of course, it has been going on simultaneously, for the plant has been operating full blast, trying to fill the worldwide channels of distribution. That's a project requiring many months when a new product like this is first introduced. The barrels with clips attached are inserted in a special conveyor and the other parts are added in turn. It's a good demonstration of the concept of interchangeability of parts, the basis of our American system of mass production. Industrial research develops the new products. Mass production turns them out at prices everyone can afford. A couple of San Francisco businessmen discuss the possibilities of a pump that will push through a pipe such unlikely items as oranges, coal, garbage, and other solids. The secret is a recessed impeller. That's the part that does the pushing. Tucked away out of the path of flow, it doesn't come into contact with the solids, only with the water that carries them. Thus, in a closed system of transparent pipe, we can see how live goldfish are whisked through the pump with no ill effects whatever. In fact, they've made this trip so many times, the demonstrators here at Western Machinery Company suspect the goldfish actually enjoy the experience. Now, let's try tennis balls with almost the diameter of the pipe itself. A couple of turns in the pump, and away they go. What's the advantage of a pump like this? Well, in industry, a great many items can be transported inexpensively from place to place by this method, with much less damage than results from conventional transportation. At a Lancaster, California olive packing plant, we get a better idea of how the pump is put to use. Here, the big problem is shuttling the olives from the trucks that bring them in to washers, then to graders, and to all the other processing machines. Every one of these moves used to involve a certain amount of bruising, which caused a definite downgrading of the fruit. Now they are pumped from one process to the next. There's less waste, and costs are reduced. Better product, lower price. 
And who benefits but us customers? Population experts tell us we'll number 220 millions by 1975, 60 millions more than now. These new Americans will need many things, and today's luxuries will be tomorrow's necessities. Machine development will make this dream a reality. In addition to goods of every description, Americans in 1975 will need more jobs to support an expanding population. Can we have wonderful and more efficient machines and jobs in increasing numbers at the same time? The history of industry says we can. The practice of industry says we will. A contractor in Kosciuszko, Mississippi, starts construction of a new silo on a local farm. Now, most farmers will tell you that you don't excavate to build a silo. A silo is a tall, cylindrical tower in which fodder is stored for winter use. But that's not always true. The first silos made were pits in the ground, and the pit type of construction is enjoying a big comeback with some interesting modern variations made possible by trenching machines like this one, a product of the Taylor Machine Works of Louisville, Mississippi. The narrow trench, dug at an angle of 15 degrees to a depth of seven feet, now is ready to serve as a form for concrete. The trench walls are clean, smooth, and straight all the way to the bottom. No wooden or metal forms are needed. Contractor Sullivan's ready-mix trucks just back up and pour the concrete right into the ground. And the concrete they pour will become the walls of the new silo, as we'll see very shortly. Two such walls are prepared, 10 or 12 feet apart, and as long as may be required. When the concrete has cured in about a week, usually, a bulldozer moves in and scoops out the soil between the two walls. When excavation is completed, concrete for the floor and apron is poured and leveled off. Once again, the earth itself is used as the form. A few days more and fodder is dumped in and packed down. And what will protect it during bad weather? Well, the top two or three inches will ferment and create a surface impervious to the elements. And when the cattle are ready to start feeding on the silage, a novel gate makes it unnecessary for anyone to serve them their dinners. It's what you might call an ingenious cafeteria for the cows.